This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Receiving life is not receiving the Bible, it's receiving the gospel. After that, the Bible opens up and it's up to us as ministers to see to it that people grow up. The salvation experience takes one split second in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast a person is saved. But discipleship lasts our entire life. And as far as I'm concerned, it's going to last into heaven too, because there we will be forever learning about God. We never reach God's level, even in eternity. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian, and that is me. Glad that you showed up today. Glad that you're ready to open up the Word of God and get started. And again, I just want to thank you because uh, all this is made possible by you. You guys are so good. And my faithful, faithful givers, my faithful partners, I just want to thank you again for being so determined to see the Word of God gets out and putting your life into it. Your money represents your life. Your prayers represent your life. Your faith represents everything that you are because you're giving of eternal things. Money only represents eternal things because I can tell you this eternal things, one, people one to Jesus Christ, people getting filled with the Spirit and, and especially believers moving on into the realms of being able to stand on the Word of God and become an obstacle to this world, to stand in faith and to slow this world down so that people can hear about Jesus Christ, you are setting aside eternal things. This is not natural things. It's not just a dollar bill you're giving. It's not just a 10 or a 20. What you're giving represents souls for the kingdom of God. When you get to heaven, you will not regret any money spent. God will never say to you, you went to church too much, or number two, you gave too much money because it's, there's no way you can give too much into the kingdom of God. So again, I thank you for being faithful, for sticking with me. If you're not a partner, you can just go to my website, bobyandian.com, and you can find out how to become a partner with me. Join my hands together and we can help win souls to Jesus. But my ministry mainly has been given to, to discipling people and to help raising up ministers for a new generation because this just multiplies the seed so many times over. And speaking of seed, oh, that's where we're going today with the kingdom parables. We began this. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Let's read over again the verses of Scripture here. Let's read verses 1 through 3. It says, The same day Jesus went out of the house, that is the synagogue, and sat beside the sea. Great uh, crowds gathered around Him so that He got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And He said... To, and he told them many things in parables. Look down with me at verses 10 and 11. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, that is the religious crowd. That's why he left the synagogue back in verse 1. It says it has not been given. On this particular day, it says when Jesus left the synagogue and stood by the seashore. This is symbolic as well as uh, determining just something that physically happened here. Leaving the synagogue, well, this was the last chance he gave to the Jews to hear the Word of God from his lips. Now he did preach the Word of God in the streets and Jews were present later. And later on he did go to the temple in chapter 24 and chapter 25 and that's the temple discourse. But here in this particular verse he walked out and what he did was he walked out of the house, that is the synagogue, and went to the seashore. The synagogue leaves represents leaving the first mission that he had. He came to his own, but his own received him not. And then he turned to the Gentiles, and this is represented by the sea. The synagogue represents the place where the teaching was for the Word of God for the uh, Jewish people and really represents by this time that Jesus had come, domination by the law. The law was never given to save, but they, pro they preached it for salvation. It was never designed to make them spiritual, and yet they preached it for being spiritual. And instead of spreading the gospel, they made proselytes of all nations, trying to turn them into Jews. And by this time, Jesus has had its fill. It now has become very apparent that as a whole, that the Jewish people did not want him, although the people on the street did, but the Jewish religious leaders did not want him, opposed him at every point. And he walked out of the synagogue and went to the seashore. The seashore again represents Gentiles because seas and oceans are a type of the Gentile nations. And he began to teach them in parables. Why did he teach them in parables? In case any religious people went along trying to follow him and hang him, follow him and, and trip him up, follow him and try to take his words and twist them. They wouldn't know what he's talking about because they were used to the complex, deeper things of the Word of God. Jesus came to minister to the people, and so he taught them starting with stories, with parables. 
and then brought around spiritual things around it. And we've mentioned this before, but uh, parables are simply types of stories. And you and I can have stories in our sermons. It's all right to have your own stories, but I can tell you this, the best stories come from the Word of God. That's why the Old Testament is predominantly stories. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the Old Testament has been given to us for examples. And I think the best thing to do is teach New Testament, New Testament doctrine, but wrap it up with Old Testament stories because those Old Testament stories teach of New Testament doctrine. And so by pulling that together, we use entirely the Word of God. Now, it's fine to throw your own testimony in. Paul did that on three different occasions about the road to Damascus. But I would tell you this too, don't get wrapped up in you. Keep wrapped up in Jesus Christ and keep wrapped up in His Word. And if there is a better story from the Word of God, go with the Word of God. So the parables cover again two upcoming times of Jesus' absence. Number one, the church age, and number two, the tribulation. Once Jesus leaves at the end of Matthew, at the end of the four Gospels, at the beginning of the book of Acts, he, he disappears into heaven. He will be gone for two time periods. Number one is the church age, which will last for this has now lasted for over 2,000 years. But then there's a seven year period he'll also be gone from the earth. That will be the tribulation. And so these things deal with the two time periods Jesus is gone, and that's why he calls it a mystery. Things which were unknown in the Old Testament now revealed in the New Testament. And so he's going to bring that out. And there are seven parables. The first one, which we're taking up today, is the sower. And then we'll take up the wheat and the tares. Then the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasure in a field, the pearl of great price, and the net, which is the gospel net that will be thrown out to the nations. The meaning of the word parable, parabole, it's a Greek word. It means to throw down beside. Para means beside. We get parallel from that word. Bole means to throw. So it means to throw down something beside. It means if you have a doctrine there, the people just can't understand it. Right down beside it, throw a story. The story helps to explain the doctrine. And it's like when you're teaching the doctrine, they'll, they're will they out there and they're, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like I've happened at church. I've been preaching something and I'll start getting to something thinking, surely the people understand this. And some are looking at me like, what planet did you land from? And suddenly God will just remind me of something, a story. A story from the Word of God that helps to explain this or a story from my own life. And so once I do it, the people go, oh, oh, I see. And so that's why a net is used for, uh, for the gospel. And leaven is used for sin in the church. And, and all the other things that we have here in this particular parables. And today we're going to take up the sower and the seed. This is also brought out in chapter 4 of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4 deals with the same thing. So we'll be referring back and forth between the two because uh, it again is referred to there. Let's begin in verse 3, Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. He told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell among the path and the birds, and the birds represent Satan. This is Mark chapter 4 where it says here, the birds came, it says, and Satan came to steal the word. So these represent demons. They represent the emissaries of Satan. They came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose up, they were scorched. Uh, when they had no depth of soil, immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In this particular parable, it'd be different from another parable that Jesus will tell later where we have the parable of the sower there. And in that particular parable, this particular parable, the sower is you. The sower is me. And so this is the different types of soil we throw it onto. And understand that the, that the seed represents the Word of God. All this is brought out of Mark chapter 4, an explanation of each one of these things. And so here we have it again. This is a believer who is witnessing or a preacher who is preaching or a minister who is sharing from the pulpit. Again, this is where we take from the seed. In fact, we're told that the uh, sower reaches into his bag and brings out things new and things old. This means, again, Old Testament, New Testament. The New Testament was coming. And this is the seed that we scatter on the ground. And so the ground represents the hearts of believers. None of these four types of ground is an unbeliever. Even the hard ground is not an unbeliever. The four types of ground represent four different hearts and so notice this, the same seed is thrown to all of them. This is not the seeds of evangelism. That will happen in another passage of Scripture where in that particular one, Jesus is seen as again, and uh, he is the sower in that one, and the seed is the gospel. And then Satan is the one coming along sowing a false gospel behind it. 
So here we have it again that the, uh, this, the, these uh, seeds fell on all the ground. I want you to notice here that these four types of seeds, since they are our believers, probably all come to church. And as you look across your congregation, know who are ministers right now, those who will be ministers, understand something. Not everybody's going to receive the Word. But you don't hold back on the Word simply because a person is hard ground. You might know they're hard ground. You might know they don't receive a thing that you're saying. And you'd love to be able just to shut them off. But I want you to understand something. The Word you are sowing is their potential. One day if they wake up and listen to that Word being sown, they can move on to thorny ground, rocky ground, eventually to good ground. And once they are even reaching good ground, they can produce 30 and then 60 and then 100 fold. The growing process of the Christian life goes on and on. This particular parable is not devoted to winning the lost, although there is another parable which is, and that's the one of the wheat and the tares. In this particular one, the sower and the seed, this sower is us. And the seed represents the word, so the seed represents maturity, growing up in the things of God or discipleship. Now understand something, the gospel is for the world, but the word is for Christians. The gospel is that segment of the word of God telling you how to become a believer. And believe me, it's a sliver of the word of God. It doesn't take much for a person to get saved. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And this gospel has been preached throughout in the entirety of the word of God. In the Old Testament, it's described this way, who has believed our report? And believing the report is an unbeliever believing the report of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them, Isaiah 52, 7, that bring glad tidings of peace. Glad tidings is the word good news, where the New Testament word gospel comes from. And even chapter 9 of the book of Romans refers to that verse of scripture that what's preached on the mountains and also the good report given in Isaiah 53, those two chapters right next to each other, represents the gospel. It says in Galatians, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, and them were Old Testament saints. So the same gospel has been preached. So this plan of salvation has always been very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, accept Him as your Lord, and you will be saved. From that point on, now we have the Word of God. And the Word of God is preached to them because why? As a sinner, the Word of God is foolishness, it declares in 1 Corinthians. And foolishness to them. But to us, it is the words of life. But you have to have life to receive the words of life. And receiving life is not receiving the Bible, it's receiving the gospel. After that, the Bible opens up and it's up to us as ministers to see to it that people grow up. The salvation experience takes one split second in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast a person is saved. But discipleship lasts our entire life. And as far as I'm concerned, it's going to last into heaven too, because there we will be forever learning about God. We never reach God's level, even in eternity. So we have it here again. These are the four types of ground. The hard ground represents again, Anyone who hears the, king, the Word of God and doesn't understand it. You see, there's where you, that's where your uh, uh, real under, where revelation comes. Revelation is another word for understanding. It says in the book of Proverbs, with all you're getting, get understanding. Understanding is revelation of the Word of God. It's not just hearing. It's when you go, oh, I see it. I understand it. And that's where real revelation comes. And that's where real power comes from to change your life. When we come back from the break, we will start again with its first ground, the hard ground, and you will be blessed. Don't you go anywhere. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. Back to our particular types of ground, four of them, they represent believers. All of these are believers from hard ground to stony ground to thorny ground to good ground. And in these, each one of these cases, what we have is these people come to church, they're all believers, but there's some that come to church and although they are a Christian, they have not advanced one inch beyond the new birth. And they're hardened toward the things of the gospel. Thank God they still keep coming to church, but they come to church for a lot of different reasons. They don't come to church to hear the Word of God. They come to meet people. Uh, boys come to meet girls. Girls come to meet boys. Men come to make business deals. I mean, all the reasons why people come to church. Social status. Some come to church strictly out of guilt. 
because they were raised in a church where the family went and they feel guilty for not going to church. It's always been a part of their life, so they come to get rid of the guilt complex, but they don't come for any other reason. Understand this, church is a place for believers to come and grow in the Word of God. It is, as Superman had, our place of refuge, a place where we come and we have that place of solitude where we strengthen ourselves. Coming to church is where a believer strengthens himself to go back out and face the world the next day. And that's why I strongly believe that there's, we need more than one just one church service a week. Man, it's good to have two or three a week and go to special Bible studies and all that. You will never regret when you get to heaven going to another Bible study while you were here on earth. And so here we have it again. But again, the hard ground. I know what it's like to preach and see people out there. The moment you say, open up in your Bibles, they go, you know, and they start watching people walk in, they watch people walk out, they count the ceiling tiles in the ceiling, they're looking at their watch every five minutes and acting like, oh God, this thing's taking forever. And they can't wait to get out of church and go. And this is the one that says Satan comes immediately and steals the word out of their heart. You know why he can steal the word immediately? Because the next type of ground says that that type of ground immediately received the word of God. If you immediately receive the word of God, Satan cannot immediately steal it. He has to figure out tricks to try to get that, that uh, word out of your heart. Because it's not you that is important to Satan. It's the word that's in your heart that really comes against the works of Satan. You might think Satan doesn't like you because of all your talent. After all, I dedicated my talent to Jesus. I got saved and look, all my singing career, now I'm dedicated to Jesus. And look, my acting career, now I can dedicate to Jesus. And look, I was well known in Hollywood. I was a football captain. I was the hair cheerleader. I mean, we go down the list of accomplishments that people have and we sometimes think, boy, God couldn't do without me. Listen, God has to sweat the somebody out out of you and make you into a nobody before he can use you because it's the you that has the problem. It's you that stands in the way, but it's you that Satan wants. He loves it when you think God loves you because of your talent and your gifts and all these things. No, God really wants you to understand you are not a self-made Christian. You are a word-made Christian and only the word of God can really make you what God wants you to be. And so the word of God will change you and cause you to become a threat against the devil, cause you to win more souls for Jesus Christ, cause you to see through the world's uh, viewpoint and look right through it and see exactly where they're coming from and be able to combat it with the word of God and the wisdom of God. This is what God is looking for. So again, this is that type of person. This sower is any believer. Uh, and this so uh, the, this sower that speaking of this in this particular uh, passage is any believer who is either witnessing to somebody, talking to somebody, counseling somebody, a minister from the pulpit. Again, all these things that's mentioned here in this that we've been talking about in the first half of this broadcast is what we do as believers. Jesus is the ultimate sower, and that will be seen later on in another passage of Scripture. But we minister. And listen, I just want to tell you too, church isn't the only place you minister. I love it when people in church would tell me they've begun a Bible study at their office or a Bible study at the factory where they work at. And for 15 minutes during the, the while people are having their lunch, they're, they're sharing a portion of the Word of God. And they talk about how these things begin to grow as Christians come from all over the place because Christians should have not only a hunger for lunch, they should have a hunger for the things of God. Hunger and thirst after righteousness to understand more of the Word of God. And so the ground in all of these cases is the healing hearing, the, the heart that hears, and hearing is the key issue. So the first one again was the wayside. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away what has been sown in his heart. And this was what was sown along the path, along the hard ground. And there are people with hard ground that come to church. Again, there's times I've seen these kind of people. I know they're not there for any other reason. Uh, to, they're not there to hear the word of God. They're there for all other types of reasons. But you know what? I still keep preaching the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because that's what's going to grab their heart. And I have seen those people at one time come to a desperate need in their life. And they came to church the next week. And for the first time ever, they opened themselves up saying, God, you have something to say to me. And the sermon speaks to them. Suddenly they understand something. And suddenly they begin to realize why all these people come to church and why they're Jesus freaks, why they're weirdos for the Lord Jesus Christ. And they didn't want to, they want to separate themselves from those extreme type of people. And suddenly they become one. And by becoming one, now they find out the word of God is everything. It is their meat. It is their drink. It is their life. It is their strength. And by yielding to the word of God, it makes them a word made Christian. And they now begin to focus on the world through the eyes of the word of God. This is what real maturity is to see the world, not as it is, but to see the world as God sees it and to understand right from wrong is the most important thing.
in this particular one, what we find out some things from this parable is, is although Satan steals the word and God is the one who gives the word, God is not the main character here. And Satan is not the main character here. It's the ground that is the main character, and that is your heart. Because God can't force His word on you, and Satan cannot come and arbitrarily steal it. So what this particular parable is speaking of here is this, is God gives and Satan steals. Satan can only steal what God gives because Satan can't create anything. Satan is out to steal from your heart what you have accepted. We allow God to give and we allow Satan to steal what's been sown in our heart. The, this one doesn't receive the word of God and Satan steals it immediately. That's this type of ground, does not receive it. And since it sits on the surface, Satan can steal it immediately. In the other types of ground, Satan has to become more crafty to steal the word of God and starts to work through pressures of life and circumstances. And that's where we move to the next type of ground, the stony ground. Let's take a look beginning here in uh, verse 20 and 21. We read about the stony ground. Let's go down now and read about the, uh, the explanation of it. Verse 20 and verse 21 says, says this, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself and endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And Mark chapter 4 says, immediately he is offended. Let me tell you what this type of ground is. This type of ground hears it and receives it immediately with great joy. It's more of an emotional receiving of it. Yes, he receives it. Yes, he understands it. But he just rejoices in that revelation. But there is no further further study after that. There is no root that goes down. And he waits for next Sunday to hear the word of God. And the next Sunday, in the meantime, the scorching heat of life and the troubles of life come along and Satan can now begin to work on him and steal the word of God. And so it says, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Notice persecution doesn't come because you're so wonderful. Persecution doesn't come because you're so talented. Persecution comes when you begin to receive the word of God. I have had people tell me, I never had these kind of problems when I was at the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, but I came to this church where we teach the word of God and all hell broke loose in my life. And they begin to say, is there something wrong? No, the answer is just something is right. You have really turned Satan against you because all those years you were in those other churches, you were no target for the devil. You came to church for social reasons. You came to church for all other kinds of reasons. You went home, you never studied the word of God. You were no threat to him. But the moment you start receiving the word of God, you become a threat. And he starts to work through circumstances, persecutions, tests, and trials. Persecution doesn't come again because the person is special, but because of the word that he has received. Satan is an equal opportunity persecutor. As long as we receive the word of God, he's going to persecute us just like he did Jesus. And Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. So again, this person immediately becomes offenses and offenses are the number one reason why people leave church. An offense is a molehill that gets magnified into a mountain. It is a side issue that Satan gets you onto. How are my children treated in children's church? My young person treated in youth department? Uh, the music they sang I didn't like. All the stuff people use as, as things coming against and become offended over and they leave the church over an offense. And when they leave the church over an offense and leave the word of God over an offense, Satan says, see, it worked. He brought an offense into their life. So it's impossible for offenses not to come, but how you deal with it is important. Now, the third type of ground is thorny ground. Look at verse 22. Now, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world that is of this age and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes fruitful. Many times people can pass the offense test, that is the pressures and trials and persecutions of life, but they can't pass the prosperity test. This one says that, that riches come along and the deceitfulness of riches. Notice it didn't say riches are wrong, it says the deceitfulness of riches is wrong. Prosperity begins to come along and people can't handle the prosperity. They come to church because they have a financial need. I'm glad they came to church through their financial need. Others have a physical need. Others have a family need, all types of needs, and that need drives them to church. It should. But once the need is met, you have a choice to make. Your barns are now filled, and what's the, what's the option? Well, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. In other words, you become greedy. No, what you should be looking for is ways to give away your prosperity and be a blessing to others, and God will keep pouring back into your life and keep your barns full. 
this verse is simply saying that that person, once prosperity comes, begins to leave the church. I've seen it happen. People begin to get their bills paid off. They got a new car and pretty soon they're not in church so often. They sit further back week after week and one day they just disappear and they're gone. The last one is the good ground and this is found in verse 23. He who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word of God and understand it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. This is the only one of the four types of ground that becomes a true disciple. Because fruit bearing is from John, the book of John, one example of what a real disciple is. A real disciple loves, a real disciple is dedicated to the Word of God, but a real disciple produces fruit. This one produces fruit and the fruit keeps increasing. There is no end to how much you can be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. This one keeps hearing the Word of God and grows from 30 to 60 to 100 fold, keeps on increasing the things of life. So this means something. You never quit coming to church. You never quit hearing the Word of God. You never quit studying the Word of God. There's no place in your life when you reach a certain age and you know so much of the Word of God that you can shift into coast because you cannot put in, there is no neutral in the Christian life. There is either forward or reverse. And you're either moving forward because if you stop moving forward, you start moving backward. And there's no place in the Christian life to sit back and just coast on what you know. Keep on learning. Even Paul at the end of his life when he was going to prison told Timothy, bring the parchments. The parchments were stuff he probably had marked up. He had written all over the place on that thing, but there's still revelation that comes from that. And he declared that when I go to die, the most important thing I want me with me is the Word of God because the Word of God lives and abides forever. His knowledge of the Word of God went with him into eternity. The car you have, the house you have, the prosperity you have, all these other things you might have used, the offenses you have, they stay here on this earth. You go to heaven. What are you going to take with you? It says in Revelation 14, 13, our works do follow us. And part of the great works is our study of the Word of God, our growth in the Word of God. We take it to heaven. We will see you tomorrow as we continue on in these particular parables, the kingdom parables. See you tomorrow. Chapter 13 of Matthew is a pivotal chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. In this revealing chapter, Jesus turns his attention away from Israel and toward the Gentiles. He begins to teach in parables about the kingdom of God so that those who truly desire to hear would understand his message. In these seven in-depth topical studies, Pastor Bob Yandian explores and teaches on the parables found in the book of Matthew. Sermon titles include The Mystery Presented, The Sower and the Seed, Why Parables, The Wheat and the Tares, The Mustard Seed and Leaven, The Treasure and the Pearl, and The Evangelism Net. To order Kingdom Parables, go to bobbyandian.com or call 918-250-2207. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918 918- 2502207 To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.